In this tutorial, I want to walk you through a more advanced keying process and my main focus here is to explain to you how I separate out the different individual steps in keying that I do. So I have a not too complex shot in front of me. So this lady here is trying to uh, destroy the apple and fails miserably and for no reason whatsoever I want to put her in this living room and I, instead of just doing the keying I want to go through a workflow through a layout that I have placed with these empty boxes here and I will talk about some pre-processing that I do before even getting started and clean plate generation the actual alpha extraction from the keying process which I will separate out from the despill process and and then talk about uh, corrections I do on the foreground and on the background and combining everything together. So this is kind of my, my setup in each of these tasks. I might split it out even further and talk about things I do on the edges and on the uh, main footage and so on. But the main goal here is really to uh, get a template for a more advanced keying workflow. This tutorial is kind of a more uh, advanced follow up to my introduction to keying tutorial. So if you're just starting out with green screen, I would recommend you have a look at this first. I also did a tutorial on the mat control node, which I will probably uh, use a couple of times here, which might also be helpful. Um, otherwise, if you just want to uh, get the idea of the overall workflow and the different tasks I can do as part of an advanced keying workflow, then this is for you. So let's dive in. Let me start here from the top and I will uh, fill those boxes, uh, not exactly one by one, but going in a logical flow. So I usually start with setting up something quickly and setting up a delta key to start from and uh, look at the alpha channel first. You can start in different places, but it's something I would do first. I have my alpha left and color right from the delta key and start by, by sampling. One of the first things even before I go further into tuning is thinking about whether or not uh, noise has a significant impact. It very often has, especially on edges. You don't always see it right away, but if you look at this edge, for example, you see it's a bit like jagged. And just to illustrate this even more, if I crank this up a bit, you know, especially from this side, you see that the edge is, you know, not very smooth. And this you can either fix with a pre-blur in the keyer, but the blur is, well, it makes everything soft, including hair detail. Um, a more advanced alternative to blur is doing noise removal, and that's what I want to do here. So I will do a noise reduction. I am in DaVinci Resolve, so I can use the Resolve noise reduction, which is the same as the one on the color page. There is a fusion tool remove noise, but it is only a spatial noise reduction, which is quite similar to actually blurring. So the temporal one is the better one from DaVinci Resolve. So I bring this one in. And now you can see on the alpha channel as I bring the temporal threshold here up, you can see that the edge, let me zoom in even further, make this a tiny bit larger, you see the impact on the edge. So it's really helping the edge. At the same time, of course, you have to look at the hair detail, but often a tiny bit here is already doing quite a lot without uh, destroying too much hair detail. So noise has a big impact on keying and noise removal is almost always a good idea. If you do see that even small amounts will destroy some detail somewhere, uh, you can do it locally. So you could decide to exclude the hair with the mask and do the noise removal everywhere else to get nice, clean, smooth edges where you have smooth edges, but retain all detail where you have like fuzzy hair detail or so. This is pretty much it what I do for general pre-processing. You can decide to do color corrections also before you start with the delta key. In some cases, it might help if you have like some overblown um, uh, some overblown highlights or so, uh, something not very well exposed, it can help to reduce this. But generally the Delta Kia is not very sensitive to overall brightness. Like bringing up gain or lift uh, will not do much to the Delta Kia because it looks more at relative differences between the individual channels. Uh, what does help is color corrections that impact those relative 
differences. Um, sometimes doing a bit of gamma correction, which you know takes the image in the middle, uh, bringing it up a bit or down a bit can uh, sometimes help. However, it's a bit difficult to see when it makes sense and when not. In my experience, I did a few comparisons with different shots. You can bring in brightness and contrast and do like a gamma change. When you do it, you need to sample again because this impacts now the green background color, so you need a new sample, right? In my experience, whenever this was helping to bring up the gamma a little bit or bring it down a little bit, in those cases I could achieve a similar result or even better result by using the gain slider here. So this is also a pre-processing kind of step which is built into the Delta Kia and it seems to have somewhat similar impact in my experience. I have seen a few people who also decided to bring the footage into a different color space for keying. So I'm working in linear color space in Fusion. This is the default if you use Resolve Color Management uh, or you can set it up manually. I have done other tutorials on that. Um, I heard from some people that working in Rec. 709 was giving them a better alpha solution. If you want to do this, I would do it up here as part of pre-processing but then use linear color space for the final uh, compositing. In each case, if you set up anything like this, and I, I will probably not use the brightness contrast, let me delete that again, but if you do anything like this, you may not necessarily want to do this for your final composite. Um, even the noise reduction, the noise reduction helps the Kia, but it may not be justified uh, for the final composite. It could also, uh, you know, destroy like detail in the foreground. Uh, I only need it for the edges. I don't need it like in general. So if I don't want to use it, that's not a problem because I can uh, use just the alpha channel from here in my overall flow and uh, ignore the, the color here, ignore the denoise, ignore everything. Just use this for the alpha channel and then apply the alpha channel a bit later. I will get to this, but first let me continue setting this up a little bit. So here in the key section, I will not use the pre-blur now because I have the noise removal. I might use the gain a bit. Let's see if it makes sense. A little bit of gain can help, but often it is a compromise with regards to hair detail. So I would be very careful on this. The balance uh, can help because it moves between, and sorry, I should undo this. I just did this for demonstration, so let me undo this. This was just to demonstrate the edge detail, so I should judge my gain first before I do any further matte refinement. This can help. Balance can sometimes help. Ignore the color changes. I'm only looking at the alpha channel now. Balance shifts between the other two channels. So for a green background, it shifts between red and blue. Um, so it gives some more emphasis towards the comparison between red and green or the comparison between blue and green in that channel comparison that the Kia ultimately does internally. Uh, so this is an internal parameter and sometimes it can help a bit if your image tends more towards red or more towards blue, you can use this. Here it helps a little bit, it doesn't solve everything. Uh, it certainly doesn't solve the uneven background and just to be sure, let me sample one more time. I sample, you know, with this, just to make sure I sample without the color uh, correction I had in between. So you see this is getting quite good, but I definitely have uneven background. I can generally fix the uneven background by using either the pre-matte or a clean plate. I tend to use a clean plate in more sophisticated solutions. This is a quick inbuilt solution, but there are very different ways of creating a clean plate and you can do all of them externally. I will use the clean plate tool here. If you have, sometimes you might shoot a clean plate on set. So shoot the same background without the actor might work. However, the presence of the actress could cause a slight change of the lighting situation or could cause a slight shadow on the background. In those cases, you might not do well with a short clean plate, but you can try. Often it can help. Otherwise, you can construct a clean plate with this tool. And this is basically a simple kind of inverse keying tool. So if I bring this in, sample the background, I sample again near her hair, somewhere where it's most important, you see that it's kind of keying out her. So it's removing her and leaving the green background. And I need to make sure I remove her as good as I can. So I might usually work with the top slider here first, then possibly bring the bottom a bit up. And if necessary, you have to erode a bit, especially if you see hair detail that is being swallowed. 
So you have to work either with this or uh, careful with this, just to, to get as much as possible from her, but leaving the background near her as much intact as possible. So that's the offset. Look at the detail at her hair where you need it most and then, yeah, get rid of it as much as possible without overdoing it. Uh, these areas here, I'm probably not concerned. I can mask them out anyway, so I don't really care. And then uh, grow the edges a bit. Usually I grow the edges a bit and then click fill. You could also grow them all the way. The important part is that around the edges of the subject, and here you see I didn't erode enough. I need to go further. There's still some like almost dirty areas. Let's do this again. So the important part is that around the edges you are growing inwards so that near the edges where the Kia has the most difficult task that you get a good idea of the background, which is like matching the background nearby. So it's growing inside. That's the idea near the edges. The rest doesn't really matter. Okay, so this is now my background without foreground. And this one I can attach to the clean plate input of the Delta Kia, this one here. You can, as I mentioned, construct clean plates in many different other ways. You can, for example, use the movement of the actress. So she is moving her head and her arm and so on. And whenever she moves, she is revealing different parts of the background. So it's possible to use that as well and use different parts of the background from different frames. These are more advanced techniques. I'm discussing like all I can think of in my compositing course. So if you want to go to that level, have a look at my compositing course. Um, but this is a, a good start and often it's a bit easier to tune it than with this internal tool. And yeah, you can have a few additional options to process this as a pre-processing step for the background. And then uh, you will see the impact on the key. So if I look at the key again with the alpha channel on the left side and let's disconnect. You see there's some, some areas here and you can see it even better if I bring the gamma slider in. Let's bring the gamma a bit up. You see really the unevenness of the background and attaching it, you get the this all sorted. I didn't worry about the clean plate here and here. Though this is all far away from the subject. Even near the table, I wouldn't worry too much because I can easily mask all of this off. So let's do this next. Let me build a mask. So I use a polygon here. Uh, let's not attach it. And I will probably, because there's often problems, like I saw some problems down here near the table and so on, I can mask this out like exactly. It's not very difficult since the table isn't moving. Uh, I don't need my Kia for the table. I will just, I, I do need it here because these, these blocks are, are moving as she, she hits this thing. So I will move away from these blocks, then take her. She is moving her arm up, so I will give some space on the top. And then down here, I will again mask out the table like this and use this as a garbage mask. So garbage mat and invert. So now I have gotten rid of pretty much everything. You can do this before the clean plate. You can do it afterwards. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, just at some point I built my garbage mask. I know that for keying I focus on the subject, not at the area around. Uh, sometimes you have to animate it. Sometimes you need more sophisticated garbage masks. Sometimes you can manipulate an existing key uh, into a garbage mask. Uh, so these are the different options here, which you can continue with. Let's look again at the foreground and let's bring this a bit down to reveal any holes. And yes, there are. Let's see if we can tune a bit more now from the matte section. So I can tune the mat here. You can do it outside with the mat control or you can do it inside here. I usually start with like the softest areas that I need, like the hair detail and see if there's some, some tuning I can do here. And then uh, if I need to fill in more or work on other areas, I might separate it out from the Delta here with a separate mat control tool. Let's start here on the soft areas, the soft hair. And I will bring this a bit down and I just see how far I can go before I I ruin my edges or ruin my hair detail. Uh, there's a bit here. I think there's also some on top. Oh. No, it's, it's not that much. It's not that difficult, this shot, actually. So we won't have that much work here. But just bringing this in a bit, not overdoing it. And often combination of this and the clean foreground can help. But clean foreground also can help with like speckles and so on, but can also easily ruin things. So probably, again, look at the hair. Yeah, here, for example, and see how far you can go. Yeah, 
not verify it will immediately destroy some hair detail. Okay, so I don't want to tune the parameters to death. I just want to go more on the overall workflow here. I often need a hard comp, soft comp approach here. This might also work for the Apple and for these inner problems. So let's quickly do this in an alternative way in my beginner introduction to keying, I did it with a second delta keyer, you can do this. Or here I will just use a matte control to ramp up the mask inside and make this like a really hard mask, which I am contracting so that it's working like inside and not touching the edges and possibly blurring a little bit, which I here, this blur works before the contract. If I need to blur it, I might do it separately. So for example, add a blur on the alpha channel and use this. So let me bring this into the box. Sorry about this. And I use this now, apply this to the delta key, for example, with a second matte control like this, where I can add this into the solid matte input. So I have a solid hard matte, which I plug into the other one and thereby get like the best of both worlds. I get uh, this soft hair detail, which is coming from the original key. And I get this hard inside which is, you know, filling out the holes that I had before. So here were the holes and here it's being filled out. The Apple, you know, I wasn't so aggressive here, but since the Apple isn't moving too much and is really in the center, I might just use an ellipse and just plug it into the solid mat here and size the ellipse down to just be here. So that's fine. That covers this area. Now the Apple is completely covered and I don't need to think too much about it here. Let's go up again. Do I have any problems outside? Any noise? Hardly any. So here it looks a little bit soft. So again, I can go into the first one. The outside mask is coming from here. Here I have the inside mask here, the outside soft mask. And I might very gently bring this up. Uh, yeah, a bit. Actually, I think this blur is not coming from here. I didn't pay attention. Yeah, it's not coming from here. This blur is coming from here. So I went uh, went too far here. So I need to erode this possibly a bit more with a bit of blur here. Okay, uh, because I touched the edge here from this edge mask. So it's a go going a bit back and forth to make sure that this inside mask is you know softly aligning with the outside mask, but is not hurting it too much. The blur is mainly there so that they don't have like hard transitions between the inside and the outside mask. So that's where the blur can help a bit. But this one here is really, you know, can really bring it in and if necessary, even go like to extremes, right? Yeah. Okay, so just the, the principle, uh, again, uh, I don't go into hours of parameter tuning here. One final part, the table here, that is still not solved by, by either of the two approaches here. But once again, I can use a solid mask for the table, especially since I have this polygon here for the garbage mask. Let's see if I can make use of it. And I will just attach a second mask here to my ellipse mask, adding it to the solid mask. And I will bring this down and I will just use this to fill the table like, like this, uh, well, almost. So let's adjust this mask a bit. I will remove the keyframe from the garbage mask. I will just mask down here. So the garbage mask is being applied after the solid mask. So in this case, I can use this rectangle to fill the lower area. And then the garbage mask makes sure that we align this properly, this mask, align it. Uh, alt left, if you need to grab the center handle somewhere else, alt left. So to align this mask here. So I have filled the table with a second mask, you know, and these two together are giving my solid mask. This one is giving my garbage mask and the garbage mask at the same time is limiting the impact of the solid mask. So everything for the masking here together. And this is my final alpha channel. Now, this is everything I do on the alpha channel. I have uh, completely ignored color until this point, And I do want to separate this out. The Delta Kia does have an inbuilt Dspill algorithm. Um, it sometimes works, it sometimes doesn't. Here it has medium results. So the apple looks more reddish than before. So the apple should probably stay green. Um, there are again ways to, to tune this a bit. Um, but I am getting into trouble once I you know want to 
for example, only specifically work on the apple or you know, do some, some other forms of manipulations. Uh, also, sometimes the despill from the Delta Kia sometimes introduces noise in the foreground. Um, and also in this particular case, because I'm doing the noise reduction before, I don't really want to use everything here. I don't want to use this image at all. I only want the alpha channel from here. So I will do a despill completely separate and I will start by bringing in a matte control here in my despill box, take the original footage with the noise, with everything, use this for despill and let's see if this works. So the matte control is a often a good option for despill. Let's set this to green and then medium. Uh, I need to bring the slider up, I always forget it because it's not there in the Delta Kia. And then check like to what level you have to go and how far you can go before you are burning the skin. So often you need to go till well done. You see here on the on the shirt there is like some, some green impact, which you know is just getting less and yeah, you probably need to go till well done to get it done. This is one option. Another option is to suppress color. So alternative, you could use a color corrector. And let me just demonstrate this as an alternative approach. So you can go to suppression and do this. So you are suppressing green, bringing green towards gray. Um, it's an alternative approach. Sometimes it works better, sometimes uh, not. Um, you can do all kinds of color corrections, right? Any color correction imaginable, you can do it locally etc. In this case the apple uh, gets red, in this case it gets gray um, and not, not that much improvement for the apple. So if I don't want a red apple I definitely need to exclude the apple from my despill operation. I could mask it out. I don't think it's moving much so that might work. If it is moving then that could be a bit of a problem. You might have to rotoscope but I could also try to key the apple. Right? So let's try that. I could try to key the apple with a separate key and very quickly let's go here and select the, the apple and I make this a bit smaller and yeah, try to get a key. Let's bring the alpha channel in. Uh, let's try again. And now I'm not looking like for a super sophisticated solution. I'm more thinking about a rough solution. I will immediately attach a mask to limit my what I'm looking at. So I will just make a rough mask like this and I can use this immediately to cut off the table so there won't be any issues from there. Attach this to the solid mat in this case and invert uh, because I'm making now everything solid and the green apple will become uh, transparent which is just what the Kia does, right? If you select the apple uh, it just makes the apple transparent. One more time Maybe I start from here and now I'm, I'm relatively aggressive with the apple. I think I can be because not only a gentle color correction, I don't really do compositing. Um, so if you just do a little bit of color adjustment and limit this to the green tones and so on, um, then you don't need such an accurate mask typically. Um, the more um, precise the corrections you are, if you do compositing with a completely different background then you need very very good masks. Just reducing a little bit of green and there's less green in the shirt and so on, it will not be visible if this mask isn't perfect. Nonetheless, let's bring this up and I might really you know blur this and maybe erode a bit. Oops. How, how far can I go? Or maybe let's try the clean foreground background. Yeah, that seems to work pretty well for the foreground. And yeah, so even even less here. Okay, so this is uh, ordinarily this would be a terrible mask, but here I think I will just add a bit of. Let me add another matte control afterwards and add a bit of blur and expand. No, I need to expand first, then blur. We, we'll see how it works. So I will just use this as a mask on my despill. And you can see if there are now any problems. Do you see any lines or so? So this mask is attached to the despill. The despill now will only work in the white area and even though this uh, key here is terrible, I think you won't see it anywhere. Yeah. Uh, not really, you don't see it really. So still despill everywhere, no despill on the apple and a bit of surrounding of the apple. Yeah. Look at the skin, so if there's still that you see, if I enable, disable the despill here, 
yeah, there isn't much on the skin anyway, so that's good. So it's more on the upper parts of the shirt. So this solution worked. Let me bring it down. And now I need to apply this and all I need to do is uh, multiply in the mask. Um, lots of different ways to do it. If you like the net control, you can use that again. You can also use a channel boolean or multiply it otherwise. You could also use it later in a merge, but I keep things a bit um, still a bit separate. So let me take a mat control and use the whole mask from the top as a inverse garbage mat. Or you know what? Um, sometimes that's confusing. Sometimes it's easier to, you know, do a combine alpha. Uh, it's sometimes easier to read the flow to know. Okay, there's another channel coming in, and I do the combine alpha here, copy the alpha in, and that brings the alpha in, but leaves the color values. And I need to post multiply to get rid of all the color values. So this way, I have applied the alpha channel from the top to the RGB despilled image coming from here. Okay, so this is now applied and let me put it on, on both sides. Look at the alpha channel again. Should probably remove the gamma now. We we'll probably not need them anymore. Let me disable them. And now this image with the mask I can merge over my background. So let's set this up here in the compositing area in this box. I will bring in a merge. There's already the background coming here, which at the moment just looks like this. So let me merge this in and dimensions aren't matching. So my background is a photograph, which is much larger. So I need to uh, resize this or so bring it to the correct size. If the foreground is the size that I need, um, then uh, I typically just bring in a background and a merge and just merge the other background over a dummy background, which is like a fast way of changing the size. So here I have now a dummy background, which is having the same dimensions as the input, the media in one, or you can manually set the desired dimension. And here I'm merging it over the desired background so that, yeah, I have my um, background here. Let me talk about background corrections since I am in this box here. Things I typically do in the background corrections. First of all, I think about the perspective. Think about uh, color corrections if necessary for the background. Think about noise and uh, lens effects. So everything camera related, how the background should match the new foreground. Um, so these things I perform on the background. Uh, you have to decide whether the background is the leading image. Did you uh, key something in order to bring it into an existing background that you might use in other shots? Or uh, is your um, source footage like the leading um, footage which you want to use and the background should just match the foreground? Um, both approaches are valid. So if I need to do perspective changes, then I bring in either a corner positioner or if it's something simple, I might actually bring in a DVE tool. So this is a relatively fast and simple way. I bring this in before the merge. The DVE tool can down here can do these kind of transformations. So it does three dimensional transformations on a 2D image. So three dimensional rotations. So if your camera from uh, the green screen footage is uh, pointing straight and the other one a bit down or so, sometimes a little bit of perspective adjustment can help. Extremes will typically not work. Let's also Think about the position. So to me, it looks like this floor is maybe a bit steeper than the table. So it could be that the camera, uh, it could just be the, the lens, uh, but it could also be that the camera is perhaps pointing a little bit downwards. So if this is the case, I might, you know, uh, adjust this a little bit. Although I think here, I, I probably, I uh, don't need to, definitely not, not such extremes. Uh, so I don't really have a lot of reference here, but if you have like straight lines in the foreground and the background, then you can use those to, to see are they really parallel or are they going closer together, uh, something like this. Otherwise, it's up to your judgment if you need this. So I think here, uh, maybe a little bit. I can use this now also to bring it down. You can also zoom here, which is just the Z move. So it has like the naming from the three dimensional changes like Z is like depth, but here you can just use it to, to zoom as well. And once again, this was probably totally overdoing it. So no need. Color corrections, 
uh, most likely I might do it on the foreground. If you need to do it on the background, here is a good place to put them here. Depth of field, uh, definitely here. So background might need to go out of focus. You can use a simple blur. Actually, a defocus node in Fusion is a more high quality version of making things yeah, blurry and out of focus. It does uh, also have some lens effects, which um, can be nice or can be distracting, but you can tune it. Here we can see a bit of specular highlights here on these objects. If you don't want this, you can remove the boom level, but you still have the defocus, which is typically a bit nicer than a, a simple blur. But you can try and compare. Last part here in the background correction is noise. So I have to add some animated uh, noise or grain. I have mentioned it also in the introductory tutorial, but either way, let me add some film. Film grain is the tool for it. Film grain, film noise, it's usually you can use the same tool. There are other techniques, but use one of those. The, this one here with the FGR behind is the fusion tool, which tends to work quite nicely. So let me add this. And then uh, I tend to look at a dark part of the foreground and a similarly dark part of the background, especially for digital noise. You often see it better in the, in the darker areas. And yeah, uh, make sure you look at it with the same zoom factor. You might uh, set it to the same zoom factor so you can easily compare. So where do we have some, some darker areas? Maybe here on the on this lamppost and then take a few a few frames, maybe 10 frames or so, and loop it through to see the animated noise. And actually I need to bring it into the viewer so I can see it. And well, even on the bright parts here, you can see it quite nicely. So I need to definitely reduce the strength probably. And yeah, so here it's it's quite weak. Okay, this is pretty much it for the uh, background section. In some cases, you might need to remove uh, lens distortion. Uh, if that is the case, you can straighten out the background, then do the compositing on the straight image without lens distortion, um, and then add it again. Fusion has some tools for uh, lens distortion, the, um, a tool called um, Distort, I think, uh, or even a grid warp can, can do the purpose if you um, have shot like a grid and then you can, can manually straighten it with a grid warp and do the inverse uh, again afterwards to uh, recreate the lens distortion if you need to. This is kind of a more specialized topic I won't go into here just as an idea of what I'm doing here. Let me continue with the compositing. So I definitely need to do something on the foreground as well. If I need to do any color corrections, I would do them here on where it says foreground corrections. I can actually do them even before I apply the mask. So then there's no risk of um, you know, forgetting the alpha multiplication or anything like this. So I can do it here on the full image if I want to. can do some color correction here. So probably make this significantly uh, brighter. Let's bring the, the gain up on the foreground. If necessary, you can always enable waveforms as well, right? So you can go into uh, views and have a waveform from viewer either for all channels or in the options. You can also get like an RGB parade you know, if it if it helps. So pretty much almost everything you can do in the Resolve color page, you can somehow also do in Fusion. So this might uh, help me uh, with this. I might then have to switch a bit back and forth between foreground and background. Look at the background and see, oh, okay, so some parts here are really, really bright, uh, like going, yeah, pretty much towards 100%. And it's a bit more like bluish cold, the background, whereas the foreground, if I look here at the foreground, um, it tends more towards reddish. So if you want, you can accordingly bring this up to a similar level, perhaps even yeah, move a bit towards, towards blue if you want. Or maybe do this just in the 
highlights, midtones, and do it individually. I'm not going into a detailed discussion here on color correction, so just mentioning that I should be doing it here. There is certainly more, so in some cases also the foreground could require some blur. I mean, it depends on the shot and the situation, right, or some defocus. Uh, it could require noise treatment if um, you need to match it to the background. You might need to do a denoise on the foreground and then uh, add uh, maybe overall noise over everything. That's also an alternative approach to, to noise removal. So it all depends on the situation, but a color correction is, let's say, at least the, the minimum I will do. I will then look at the edges uh, individually and there the workflows can be um, quite different depending on what you want to do. So I could, for example, use this matte control to manipulate the edges. I will definitely judge this like over the final image because now I'm uh, not talking about the alpha channel of the edge. Well, that might also still need some adjustments, um, but that I would do um, before in the in the alpha channel uh, section here, if I need to tuck the edges in or out or so, as I have, have done, make it harder, make it softer. That's one kind of looking at edges, but another topic is the color of the edge. And the reason is the edge itself is semi-transparent. That means that green light was shining through the edge pixels. That means originally, um, before the despill, the edge pixels were green or greenish. Um, the despill already removed that and brought that towards neutral, uh, but then it depends on the background whether or not that is correct, because the new background will shine through those edge pixels and therefore um, neutral is correct if the new background is neutral, if the new background has a strong color, if it's like reddish or bluish or so, then your edge pixels, your semi-transparent edge pixels shouldn't just be neutral, but they should match with the new background. There are different ways to, to deal with this. So the simplest one of them is to go here into the matte control, into this fringe uh, setting for fringe gamma shape and color corrections. I mentioned it in the video on matte control, so uh, you can look back at there if you need to do this. So here the background is pretty neutral, it's pretty much gray. Yeah, even here there's really not much we need to do in this particular case. Maybe think about the gamma and you can, can try, you know, if you need to uh, bring this up or down a little bit. If you feel there's like a dark fringe, maybe bringing it up in this case with this bright background a tiny bit can help. Otherwise, I will probably not, not do much here in this particular scenario. If you have very strong colored backgrounds, uh, if it's uniform, you can do it here. Uh, if you have very strong local uh, contrast, um, then you might do something like a adaptive despill, where you use the background image itself to add spill color into um, the, the spill. So then we are going into a bit more advanced workflows. Again, here is not necessary and for this overall discussion of things to do, uh, I don't think I will cover it here. But generally the idea is you take the background image again, uh, use an edge mask to uh, work on the edge itself and there you might use the background color and kind of multiply it with the spill color on the edge. Um, again, the flow for this is a bit more complicated and a bit more than I want to cover here. Uh, but this is something how you uh, can inform the edge color decision based on the background. In this case, I call this here compositing and edge treatment. And the reason is that for the edge, sometimes you can do the edge color only on the foreground, which I did up here in the matte control, but sometimes you need to work with foreground and background together to get the both best compositing result. Um, and then that's why I said uh, compositing and edge treatment here together where foreground and background meet because it is kind of an overall um, approach. This is also the place where I would think about any other form of edge refinement. Um, two things come to mind right away, but it all depends on the circumstances. Uh, sometimes a tiny little bit of blur specifically on the edge can help if you don't overdo it. Um, so that's a little bit of a, a cheat, but you know that the uh, foreground and background are artificially put together and the edge is just the place where it's uh, most noticeable and bringing things via color correction and edge correction close together so that it does make sense uh, is a good way. Um, but at the end, in a realistic film situation, um, pixels do mix, right? Um, I mean, if you go to, if you zoom up enough, then you, you see pixels where some light from, from two 
places of the edge from left and from right like fall onto the same pixel, right? Where foreground and background like fall onto the same pixel. Um, and to simulate this kind of, you can uh, apply a tiny little bit of blur for these kind of things. You need an edge mask. Um, Again, I mentioned how to build an edge mask in the tutorial on matte control. Um, it's one way to build one. Let me quickly do it. Let me build this separately. Let me build this up here. You might use it for, for different purposes. So I will do a bit of blur on the alpha mask and let me set this back to the normal 2D viewer and look at the alpha channel. So I will blur this mask a little bit like this. And then I will, from this blurred version, I will subtract and subtract the original one. So I will take a second matte control, set this to alpha and subtract and yeah, connect one to the other. And thereby I have a inside edge mask. Tip, if you need an outside edge mask, all you need to do is switch foreground and background, which you can do via control T. Now I have an outside edge mask. You know, little, little tricks with these matte control tools go a long way. So if you need uh, like a halo around the subject, you could uh, get this simply like that. Anyhow, I'm not talking about matte control and building these masks, just a reminder that you can do it and can control the width of this uh, here. So you can just make a tiny bit of edge mask like this. And I will use this mask now on a blur node and blur foreground and background together, which I can do if I apply it after the merge. So that's why I'm saying like compositing and edge because I'm using the edge from the foreground, but I'm doing the blur on foreground and background together with this mask. And now maybe one pixel blur is already everything I need. Let me bring it into the viewer and see if we can we zoom in. Yeah, you know, it's really subtle. Uh, we might actually bring this mask a bit up because this is like very faint. This is the alpha channel. If you look at the alpha values, it's like way below. It's like 0 0.1, 0, something like that. So you might bring this up just by ramping this up. So we have a higher yeah, alpha values here and then the blur here will do more. Again, so with, without blur, sorry, wrong tool, blur. So let me select again the blur tool and just this one, one pixel blur. Yeah, so you see it's doing a little bit and you can judge in different areas if it's doing the right thing or if it's, if it's, if it's a good thing or not and can uh, adjust this further. May not be necessary in this particular case. Uh, so I'm more generally speaking about the kind of activities I might do here. So blurring the edge like a tiny little bit could help. In some cases, a light wrap. This is the case if you have like a strong light behind the subject, especially then you might observe that light is like wrapping around the subject. It is uh, a correct physical phenomenon, but it's not needed everywhere. So here in this case, um, there isn't a strong light source like directly behind her. So I don't expect like a halo from the background wrapping around. But these are also things that I'm thinking about here. If it's necessary, you can uh, do this, uh, build some form of rim light um, and so on, where the background is kind of informing the, the foreground and uh, manipulating the foreground edges. Okay, I think this is it what I want to cover here. This was a long tutorial already. Um, of course, there are additional topics like relighting or building artificial shadows or lifting shadows from the green screen. So there are these specialized uh, topics. Um, you probably, when you know about the topics and you have the basic tools to, to build them, whatever the problem is, you find a place in the workflow to uh, put them in. But I think as a, a good general framework of looking at the topic and working your way through from beginning to end, I think this can help. So let me make this like the flow completely full screen and have a quick review. Um, or in case you want to take a screenshot, uh, you can probably, let's see, maybe here something like this. So starting from my original green screen, I'm building a clean plate or I have a clean plate from a different source. By the way, here I didn't do it on the noise. You can also use the noise reduction, pipe that into the clean plate would probably be the better flow here. I didn't pay attention when building it. Probably I would go from here to there. So um, just so that this is actually the clean plate for the correct example. Or if you have an external clean plate, do the same noise reduction on 
on both. So this would be the starting point. I'm doing the alpha extraction with whatever mask manipulation trickery I might need in order to get a really good alpha channel. So here I'm focusing on a really good alpha channel starting from the softest areas from the hair and the most details and then filling in the rest as needed, masking around as needed. In parallel I'm working on the D-spill. So in this case I needed to have some local exclusion from the D-spill, specifically for the D-spill. In case of the alpha channel I could just plug this apple just with a very rough mask for the D-spill itself. I needed something slightly more uh, finer so I decided to key and use that key uh, specifically to manipulate my D-spill. Uh, you can also do spill reduction um, with uh, different techniques. You can use the color corrector node, you can use hue curves uh, for spill suppression to remove green component from your image and there are a few other techniques for D-spill as well. Um, then both on the foreground and on the background you may have to do corrections to uh, match them to each other in terms of color, in terms of sharpness, in terms of noise, in terms of uh, lens uh, distortion if applicable. So I do these kind of things and then uh, finally I bring foreground and background together and while bringing it together I really evaluate the edges once again and think about the color along the edges and you can do color correction on the edge uh, either inside the matte control or if you have an edge mask like the one I uh, used here you can use this for selective color correction on the edge or for selective blur on the edge and you can use this also to build light wraps and uh, other more advanced topics. Okay this was it for my overall keying workflow. If you have questions on specific steps I can probably do detailed tutorials on one topic or the other. This was just to give you like an end-to-end -end idea of the process. Let me know what you need. Let me know in the comments. There is a lot of keying in my compositing course and there is a bit of keying in the Fusion VFX course. So my Fusion VFX with Resolve is more like a general fusion uh, all-round introduction. The compositing course really goes into a lot of detail for keying, uh, rotoscoping, integration, multi-pass compositing and all that beautiful stuff. So if you're interested have a look at my courses and thanks for watching and see you next time. Cheers!